You know, one of the most uh, interesting uh, studies, uh, Bible studies, is the one where we study the actual character of God. I'm so happy that um, uh, Marty is going to be teaching a class in the next quarter. Uh, you know, Theology 101, the character of God, be a great study because you, uh, you learn more, not just about what God said and what God has asked us to do, but more about His own character and personality, and that, that is always a very edifying study. You know, we're blessed as Christians because unlike unbelievers, pagans, and skeptics, who can only witness God's power and timelessness and then call it something else, you know, they'll call it uh, Mother Nature or the universe or the ecosystem or the gods of the earth, you know, anything except giving credit to the one who actually created everything. We, on, their hand, on the other hand, as Christians, we have at our disposal a book which not only reveals uh, the God whose power created all of this, but also reveals something about God Himself. Not just the creation, but God Himself. Unlike Star Trek and all of its imitators, whose goal is to search the stars for knowledge and quote other life forms, they're going to be looking a long time. <laughs> We Christians have access to the information about the one who actually created the stars and all the forms of life. From the Bible, we can know what God created as well as when He created it, why He created it, when it will end, and what it all means, all from this book. In addition to this, we can also know the thinking, the character, and the demands of the one that made everything. That's what we will do briefly in a very limited way tonight in my lesson. I want to focus on one characteristic of God, a characteristic that factors quite significantly in His relationship with us. See, God's character has so many different facets I mean, He is holy, He is merciful, He is wise, He is gracious and kind, He is just, He is righteous, you know, we could go on and on. And He is also perseverant, perseverant. And it is His perseverance that I want to speak about tonight. Now, before I talk about God's perseverance, I think I should explain what perseverance is, so we'll all be on the same page as far as this term is concerned. The dictionary defines perseverance as follows. To try hard and continually in spite of obstacles and difficulties. Pretty good definition. Or the quality of being persistent. Someone who perseveres. We say, for example, that a student perseveres in a difficult class. Or the final four on Survivor persevered for 39 days despite the heat and the bugs and the discomfort. Or the phone solicitor sure is persistent when she calls. Now in the Bible, the word is never directly used to describe God. You'll never find in the Bible you know, someone will say, God, persevere, you know, not in that way. Rather, it is used to describe how people should be or how they should act. For example, the original Greek word translated into the English word perseverance also meant endurance, steadfastness. Another example, in Romans chapter 13, verse six, Paul the Apostle speaks of rulers who need to persevere in the task of governing the people. And in Ephesians chapter six, verse 18, again, Paul exhorts Christians to persevere in prayer and watchfulness on behalf of the church. So this is accurate because man is, you know, the, these descriptions, we should persevere in this and that and the other. This is accurate because man, mankind is weak. We have to focus. 
we have to continually will to reach our goals, whether they be material goals or spiritual goals, we've got to persevere because we, there are all kinds of obstacles, right? And we know that human beings are easily distracted, we fall victim to sin, we often quit because of obstacles or tests, and so for us, perseverance is a virtue to be cultivated and practiced if we want to achieve our goals. Now, for God, there are no obstacles. <laughs> God doesn't have any weaknesses. He has no temptations to overcome. He doesn't, he's never tempted to quit. And so perseverance is not something he needs to acquire. He doesn't need to cultivate perseverance in his character in order to improve his character. This is one reason why this particular word is not used to describe him. However, this is not to say that he does not exhibit this trait as part of his character. The Bible doesn't use the word perseverance to describe God and his actions, but the Bible is filled with examples of God exhibiting this very quality, continuing in something. So let's talk about the perseverance of God. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. First, God perseveres in judgment. God perseveres in judgment. Have you noticed that from the Garden of Eden to the battle with the serpent in the book of Revelation, God is continually jud judging His creation. If you're a parent, and let me give you an example here, if you're a parent or a teacher or any kind of manager or supervisor, you will know how difficult this can be to continue in judgment to continue in direction. Anyone who's responsible for upholding the rules, anyone responsible for upholding the company policy, the law, the quality of something, knows that this is a difficult job. I mean, you want to quit, you want to compromise, you want to change, you want to let things slide. Sometimes you just want somebody else to do it. You get tired of having to discipline and judge and admonish. You know, this is why the youngest in the family is often spoiled. You know, we say that as a joke, but you know, by the time you get around to your last one, whether it's the second, third, fourth, sixth, whatever, it's like, okay, you can just raise yourself. You know, I'm done. <laughs> I've had to say no a million times in the last six or seven years with your brothers and sisters. You, know, you, can just, you go for it. That's why grandparenting is such fun. You don't have to judge, right Nisi? You don't have to judge, you don't have to discipline. You want Coca-Cola before supper? Sure, come on down. Let grandpa open that liter bottle for you. <laughs> you don't have to punish. That's one of the joys, not all the joys of course, but it's one of the joys because that's one of the hardest things to do as a parent, to say no, 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 no you can't. I've told you this a hundred times already. No, it'll always be no. Persevering in judgment, oh, so difficult. And yet from the beginning of time, God has judged Every man, every woman, every family, every leader, every nation, everyone in both the spiritual world and the physical world. And he has done this perfectly, consistently, and justly. You know, people, you know, when they talk to me, you know, you know, we're talking to people who have perhaps lost a loved one, and maybe that individual you know, either was not very faithful to the church or was a nominal as a Christian or perhaps not interested in religion. And of course, people worry. They say, oh my, I wonder what happened to grandpa or uncle Joe, you know, if he's okay. And you know, what do you think? Do you think he made it to heaven? Well, you know, what an impossible question. We, I don't know. I don't, you know. I don't get to decide that. 
But one of the answers that I find very comforting in situations like that is to say God is just. God is fair. You can be absolutely sure that God will do the right thing by your grandpa or your uncle Joe or whoever. He'll do the right thing. Even you will agree. When you see or hear God's judgment on that individual, you will say, amen, that, that was the right thing to do. And that's the best we can do. So when we see how God perseveres in judgment, it should do two things for us. Number one, it should comfort us in the knowledge that the evil ones in this world will be judged. God will not quit until all the justice is done. There's great comfort in that because sometimes we look out into the world and we see the tremendous injustice being done to individuals. Countries where they've had natural disasters and people are living in tents and they're cold and hungry and the, and the, the other nations will send food and, you know, and supplies to help those people and greedy politicians or whoever you know, will intercept all that aid and sell it and, and keep the profits for themselves. You know, you're, that is so wrong. Or leaders of countries uh, and I don't want to get into all this politics, but we, we, we watch the same news. Leaders of countries you know, who are dropping bombs on their own people. That is so wrong. And it seems that that leader or those crooks, they get away with it and they, you know, they're fat and hungry, uh, 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 well satisfied, they live in big houses, nobody bothers them. Those poor people, they die of starvation and disease, you know, a miserable death. These guys keep living till they're 95 years old and you know, buried with flowers on their grave. It's just not fair. But when we think of the perseverance of God in justice, we can take comfort in the fact that God will not miss the opportunity to judge every single person. And sometimes that's the only comfort we can take when viewing the injustices that take place in the world. And sometimes the injustice isn't that far away. Sometimes it's on our own families. Bad things that have happened, selfish things that have happened, Terrible things that parents have done to children or children have done to parents. I mean, I've seen situations where a, a mother, an aged mother, uh, was, was evicted by her own son out of her own house so that he could get his hands on the property and sell it and make money with it. I mean, talk about wrong. And you know, she still loved him. <laughs> she was ready to forgive him. He'd be okay if he stood in judgment in front of his mother, but he's going to stand in judgment in front of God, not his mother. And he will judge. He perseveres in judgment. So that should give us some comfort. And also it should warn us that we too will be judged. So we must prepare for that time by believing and by obeying Jesus Christ. Nothing will stand in the way of God's judgment. He will persevere. This should make us happy, either happy or afraid, depending on how we're going to be judged, how we think we're going to be judged. Secondly, in this thought about perseverance, God perseveres not only in judgment, He perseveres in mercy. When I read the Old Testament, especially the records of the various kings of Israel, I am amazed by God's persevering mercy. Now the Bible uses other words for this, words like loving kindness or long suffering, but these refer to the same thing. You know, when you read the Old Testament, judges, right? The various leaders, they would commit horrible sins. You know, they'd burn their children on altars to pagan gods. They would lead their people into all kinds of sinful activity and yet, God would persevere and preserve that nation from its enemies and provide food and shelter for them for decades. You know, in our country these days, we're 
some are terribly afraid that one person will become president and then others are terribly afraid that the other person's going to be president. And there are all kinds of scenarios. Oh, why the, you know, the sky's going to fall if so-and-so gets elected or you know, things are going to fall apart you know, if so-and-so gets elected. But if you read in the Old Testament, some of these wicked kings would rule for 40 years. Not four years, 40 years. And because of the perseverance of God in mercy, the nation somehow would survive. And then if you keep reading, another king would come along and ask for forgiveness and he'd make an effort at repentance. And what would happen? God would forgive. God would restore them to more peace and more prosperity. Over and over again we see God not being stopped from loving His people and blessing them. He persevered for centuries in His love for a people who were unlovable. You know, I make a, a, another parenthetical statement here, just an aside for us. We're talking about politics and so on and so forth. It's okay to pray for your person, whoever your person is. But I think it'd be more useful if we pray for the nation as a whole, as believers. And our prayer should be whoever, whoever gets in, God have mercy on us. God remember us who call on your name. Remember he looked after the nation because of those who were calling on his name. And there are millions, millions of people here in the United States you wouldn't know it by the media because they don't pay attention to us. But there are millions of people in this nation who call on the name of the Lord to maintain this nation. And God can do this despite whoever happens to hold the office of president. God can work over, under and around and through any individual regardless of their political philosophy. So I take great comfort in this idea because in my own life, only a God who perseveres in love and mercy could continue to love me as I drift in and out of love with Him. <laughs> Sometimes all in the same day. <laughs> I really love Him in the morning and then in the evening, whoops, <laughs> I've drifted. My confidence in my salvation is not based on my love for God, it's based on His persevering mercy towards me. What does the song say? My hope is built on what? Yeah, Jesus Christ. My hope is not built on how strong I am, how faithful I am. My hope is in His mercy. Thank God for your mercy, God. Where would I be without it? Because like you, I suspect, there are days when I get it right. There are stretches when my love perseveres through the temptations and obstacles and the weak flesh that I inhabit. And this feels good. And it's, it's a high point spiritually for me. But as Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, God's love and mercy for me was present before the creation of the world and He will always persevere in it despite the ups and downs of my love until and beyond the end of time. In other words, the promise is He loved us before we were even here and He will love us after we are gone. That's how much His love covers us. He perseveres in mercy, even when we don't. And then a third, but certainly not final way that He perseveres in judgment, in love and mercy, He perseveres in sanctification. Sanctification, we've learned that in the morning class here in the auditorium, the process of sanctification. Some have learned, as I said in our Romans class or doctrines class, the process of sanctification is that process where God, 
through the cross of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through His inspired word, through the ministry of the church, through His providential care, through all these things, God helps each Christian to grow and to mature in Christ. You know, we've said justification is a one-time thing. Sanctification is a process, a lifetime thing. Justification happens when you're buried in the waters of baptism and you raise up a new creature in Christ. On that day, you are justified, you're innocent, you're saved, and you're never any more justified any other time in your life than the day you were baptized. So we can have a, a senior saint like Bill Farmer over here, and we can have a young saint like James over here, and there may be, I don't know, 70 years between their days of baptism, let's just say, and yet Brother Bill is not any more saved than Brother James because you never get more saved than on the day you're justified through the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. Yes, that's a one-time thing. Sanctification, on the other hand, that's a process, a lifelong process, where through the cross and the Spirit and the Word and the ministry and the providential care of God, God matures you as a Christian. And the point I want to make here is that God is relentless in this process. He perseveres in our sanctification. And no one is excused, and no one is forgotten, and no one is mishandled. Every single Christian is in the process of being matured or sanctified by God. The problem is that we sometimes forget or neglect to attend to the activities and the exercises, you know, like worship and study and service and prayer and fellowship, the exercises that stimulate our development. But you know what? God never does. That's why I tell my children, our children, from the, the, the earliest time when they could understand this teaching. I've always said to them, it's always about faith. Everything that happens in your life, it's always about faith if you are a Christian. God is always, He's relentless. You're at the ball game and something happens and you're taken out of the order and the, the coach benches you for whatever reason, it doesn't seem fair. And what's it about? It's about faith. It isn't about baseball, it's about faith. How are you as a Christian going to handle that? Or your marriage blows up and falls apart and oh, what am I going to do? What is that about? It's still about faith. And they find the cancer inside of you somewhere. It's not about that you're going to die anyways of something. And when people are so surprised, I'm so surprised. I never, I've got cancer, I've got this, or I, they've told me I've only got 26 more years to live. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're like surprised that death is going to happen to them. And yet it's happened to everybody else we know. Why wouldn't it happen to us? Why are we so surprised? And when that happens, what's it about? It isn't about the disease. It's always about faith. Always. Why? Because God is relentless in His pursuit of our sanctification. You know, the preacher, he can only get to us in the church building so that we can have a healthy workout. But God perseveres every single day and every single night challenging us, examining us, encouraging us to do away with sin, to grow in the spirit, to let go the world and let more of our lives be in the control and the power of Jesus Christ, always. He never lets us go. 
So you can leave the church building and the brethren behind when you depart from here, but God perseveres in His task of remaking you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, wherever you go. Wherever you go, whatever you do, and whatever happens to you, it's always happening in order to help you to grow into the image of Christ. You know, these people say, what's my life about? What's God's plan for my life? Well, I've got the answer for you. Listen up. Here's God's plan for your life. Okay? Your life, my life, everybody's life. For those who are not Christians, God's plan for them is that they believe Jesus Christ. Not that they become superstars. Not, they, not that they win America's Got Talent. Not that they get a gold medal. Not that, God's plan for their life is that they become Christians. You know, people have an accident and they have a close call with death and, and all of a sudden they're saying to themselves, whoa, I mean, I, you know, God has a plan for me. What is it? Yeah, the plan is that you believe in Jesus. That's the plan. And then Christians, I often hear people say that. What's God's plan for me? Well, His plan for you is that you be sanctified and become in the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's His plan for you. Now, while that plan is being worked out, if you want to be an accountant, that's okay. <laughs> you want to be a rugby player? Fine, be a rugby player. Because God's plan for you is still the same, that you be a sanctified rugby player. And you, know, you get the point I'm making here. We always think that God's plan is only that I become a minister. Well, that's His plan for some people, I guess. But ministers, like everybody else, are in the process of sanctification. That's what God's plan is for me, that I be sanctified. So it's a good thing that God perseveres because if He didn't, we would we'd be like those astronauts you know, in the movies who accidentally cut themselves off from the spaceship and they, they drift away into endless space. That's always a terrible scene or thought, isn't it? But we do that to ourselves with sin and ignorance and neglect. We cut ourselves off from a loving God and what do we do? We slowly drift into the blackness of disbelief and then ultimately the blackness of hell. But thankfully God perseveres in judgment to remind us every day to stay close. He perseveres in mercy to reattach us to Himself through His love whenever we begin to drift away and reach out for rescue and safety. And he perseveres in sanctification, not letting us remain as we were, but transforming us each day into a new creation, ready for an eternal life with him through Christ in heaven. Where am I going? Where is the plan leading me? It's leading me to heaven. And any road I happen to take that's taking me away from heaven is the wrong road. And all these things that I mentioned tonight, the judgment, the mercy, the sanctification, this is never going to stop. The God of heaven will always persevere in these things until everything is complete. And so the question, of course, is how have we responded to His pursuit of us in these ways? Have we prepared for the judgment to come by believing in Jesus, dying with Him in baptism? Because that's His plan for you if you have not become a Christian. Have we responded to His mercy by showing mercy to others? And have we submitted to His efforts to rid us of our worldly habits and desires and focus our attention to love in the name of Christ. If we have, then brothers and sisters, take courage because no matter what, God will persevere with us until everything in us is perfected. It's not up to me to perfect me. 
It's up to God to perfect me. And the wonderful thing is that He has promised that He will succeed. So if we haven't, then please know that God perseveres in calling us again through this lesson tonight, calling us to come to Him now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement to those who may need to respond in some way. Please don't be shy, don't be afraid, come if you need to as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.